welcome to the video. This one is the second part of my journey in pub rock. Well, we're within pub rock or whatever. And this one takes in the 1980s. Well, approximately. I think it really starts about 79, something like that. So without further ado, let's start this roller coaster ride. <laughs> Now, you can either watch the first video I did about the 1970s first. There's a link up there. I don't think it really matters which order you watch them in because everything's happened, hasn't it? It's all in the past, so there won't be too many spoilers. Punk did happen in 1976. There are two things I forgot to mention, which I realised after I'd made the last one for the 1970s. The first one was the period of time I spent living in number two, Hallmead Road, London West Nine. First floor flat. And downstairs was a lady of the night, shall we say, who was a very nice, we hardly ever saw her. All these flats were formerly owned by the famous slum landlord, Peter Rackman. Though it wasn't particularly a, a slum, it was just like a 1950s style flat. And there was a bath in the kitchen and it had the chopping board and things over the bath. I was working in a nightclub just below Paddington Station, which I can't remember the name of it. It's gone completely out of my head, but it was quite a famous one. A lot of the gangsters from the area used to go and drink in there. And I shared the flat with Chris, who's the head barman there, and I really annoyed him, and it all came to a head when we went off on holiday to Tenerife, or all places. It was very new then. Players Los Americanos, or whatever, was being built when we were there. So I was so annoying, and I hold my hands up, that Chris stopped speaking to me about half way through the holiday and I don't think we ever spoke again. And then the other thing I didn't mention in my last thing, which does all tie in, before I went to work with Bob Kerr at Smart Booking, you know, I was like the managing director of a t-shirt printing company and I better not say too much about this, but the main guy who was behind it was a guy I'd met many years earlier and he basically was an armed robber who'd been offered a place at Cambridge University who I won't name I think he's still with us living in the on the south coast as far as I know very nice chap I was sort of fronting it I was the managing director because he and his partner couldn't be on the letter heading but I could because I was an upstanding person and this brought me into contact with Beggar's Banquet because Beggar's Banquet had a record shop on the opposite corner to where our t-shirt printing factory was and they had a rehearsal room so this is probably I don't know it's probably after I got back from Ely so when I was working these t-shirt films I would go around all the record companies at that time people like Stiff Records were starting we used to love t-shirts for Stiff and Badgers and things and we used to do most of them for Virgin and my background was obviously very useful to the people that owned the t-shirt company and I was reasonably well paid but it wasn't really where my heart was this is when I left to work with Bob Kerr. Let's go forward in time to after the Bob Kerr thing, because at the time as well, I didn't mention, I was also working with Desmond Decker. Are you ready to sing? I can't hear you. Are you ready to sing? All right, now we'll sing that song. Yeah, Who was a huge reggae star, and I loved his stuff. I really did, and his stage show was fantastic. <laughs> The only thing was that Desmond was a troubled man. He had problems with his ex-wife and things. His life was very turbulent, and I think his health suffered as a result of that. And he and his manager, Delroy, remember this is the 1970s and 1980s, they were very, not suspicious, but they were very wary of being ripped off by frankly, white people such as myself, because that was basically the way it worked back then. The artists, especially from Jamaica, did all the work, and some white person took all the money. So I was trying to get them working on that as an agent. Desmond and I shared a birthday, 16th of July. For several years, we'd all meet up. There'd be me, Delroy, Desmond, Gina Washington, his wife, a few other people would meet up probably at the Half Moon Putney, because that was our central point. I can remember one birthday when we were all there, and there was, and I think at the table as well, there was Bert Yangsh and Wiz Jones, because they, they were friends of ours, and possibly Ralph McTell, because he used to drink in there as well. So we were all there, there was a band playing in the back, we, we didn't get involved with that, because we were like off duty sort of thing. And Jimmy Page was obviously watching the band, and I can remember that he 
came out of the music room to go to the toilet, because in those days the toilets were in the main bar. And he so like looked at this table, did a double take, and then he just like shrugged and went in the toilet and that was that. But that was always been a moment which just stuck in my mind. After I left working with Bob Kerr, because we sort of didn't fall out, it's just that we had a disagreement about who was doing what, and it was just, we hadn't thought it out before we started, basically. And I went down and I got an office at Wimbledon Theatre. This is probably, this is probably 1980 by this stage, maybe 81, who knows? And so I had an office at Wimbledon Theatre. I socialised with the people who worked there with, the, the manager was a guy called Mike Lias. He had a guy called Johnny Jones, Jonah, who's not still around, who's a bit of a music legend, very funny guy. He was very close with Georgie Fame in the 60s and he worked with Ralph McTell and people like that. And Johnny Jones was what we call a bit of a rough diamond. And he was so funny, but often he didn't realise that he was being funny, do you know what I mean? He was brought up in Tutin. I'm pretty sure he was adopted because the woman he called Mum, I don't think was his mother. They certainly had a very strange relationship and she ruled him with a rod of iron. He was a, he was a bit of a hard man, but not as hard as he sort of like pretended to be, if, if you get my drift. He had a heart of gold, Jonah, basically, so he was a very good friend to me and to lots of people. I'll probably do a video just about him at one stage, because it'd be a shame to waste Jonah in this. But one incident, I can remember, he was on tour, like the tour manager with Ralph McDell. And when they went away, they were very frugal, shall we say, so they go away in a camper van, and they'd have a fridge and they'd do their own breakfasts and things like that. And Jonah, there was a guy who was a sound man called Doon Gordoon, who was a Scottish man who, again, is no longer with us. Funny, he was a sound man, but he was always totally deaf. So what happened was somebody had bought the bacon and somebody had put a half-eaten apple in the fr fridge next to the bacon. This may sound weird, I don't know, because like, I'm like, the ones I'm putting in are the ones I think are hilarious. But of course, other people may be watching going, what is he on about? So comment, let me know. And if you like this video, please like it. And if you're not subscribed, please get subscribing. So anyway, Jonah came into the um, dressing room and he was like, very upset. And he goes, well, that's it then. We might as well throw away the bacon. And so Ralph goes, what do you mean throw away the bacon? We only just bought it. So Jonah goes, well, it's all tainted. And he's going, what do you mean? Somebody left an apple in there and it's tainted all the bacon. Because the thing about Jonah is, he didn't eat fruit or vegetables. His life was like, you know, I mean, he was, his idea of like a celebratory meal. I remember he took me out for a celebratory meal for his birthday. I think it was his 50th birthday or something. We had basically go to the Wimpy Bar on Wimbledon Broadway. <laughs> And he walks in and the guy's around there counting it all sweaty and covered in stains and things on his thing and he's like tossing the burgers and Jonah walks in and goes, hello chef. <laughs> Happy days, you see. In that world of music promoting in southwest London, which was based around Putney, by the way, there were four key players. I was the junior one, Johnny come lately. The elder statesman was a guy called Bill Knox, who was, even then, was getting on a bit. It's very hard to judge now, because obviously, when you're in your 20s, anybody who's over, like, 30 seems quite old. But Bill was definitely 20 years older than me. So he'd worked on in Tin Pan Alley with Kenny Ball back in the 1950s, and he was like an old school guy, and he knew all the, the older school people of the 1950s, Lonnie Donegan and um, people like that. And he used to do the King's Head for Fulham, and he was a guy who did shows, which I did, didn't really mention, the Star and Garden had this fantastic ballroom. And it was like, it was quite big, but it was quite posh as well. It's now a wedding venue, and I'll try and find a photograph of it. So it gives you an idea of what, what, it, looks, what it was like then, because then it was just like a boardroom you had. But upstairs at the White Lion, because I mentioned the White Lion in my previous video, that had a sprung dance floor. So that was amazing. I mean, when the punks were pogoing, like for, for to UK subs or to the Poison Girls, whatever, and down, it was like a very good bounce, because an old fashioned sprung dance floor. And I think the Stan Garty one might have been sprung as well. I don't know, but I was certainly upmarket, and it was more money to hire. So anyway, Bill did shows in there and moved on to King's Head afterwards. He also did shows in the Half Moon. I think he might have helped start the music in the Half Moon back in the early 60s, because that's how long. People talk about pub rock starting in 1971 in May at the Tally Ho, but the Half Moon was putting on at shows, especially folk sort of stuff, because that's what it was known for. 
back in the 1960s, so there you go. The teacher, Joe Pearson, he was more at market. He used to like put, only put on things that he really liked and were really good. I mean, he, he, he had a relationship with the agent for people like Paul Brady and Richard Thompson and people like that. So he tended to do that sort of thing. And quite honestly, his margins were way for thin. Anyway, cut long story short, Joe was asked by the landlord of the cricketers at Kennington Oval to go and up the bands there. Joe, obviously being a teacher, didn't have time to do it, so he asked me, fatal mistake this, because I stabbed him in the back, very much like Julius Caesar. That's a brutus bootless, Neil. Spear hands for me! So anyway, I, and I sat on the door and booked a few of the things, and eventually Joe was like, I think something was happening in Joe's life, and he couldn't really devote much time to it. Plus, Keddy, the landlord, was the sort of guy who wanted like a hands-on sort of thing. So he would say, oh, can you come and see me, Joe? And Joe couldn't because he had a teacher's meeting or something. And a friend of mine, John, who was down, basically, I think, was whispering in Kenny's ear about, oh, you should get Jim to do it. I mean, he's like really good with me, obviously. I genuinely had no input into that. I Obviously, I wanted to do it, and I did do it eventually, because eventually, Kenny goes, right, I've tried to get older Joe, can't get older him, you're now doing the music. So that's how I got into the cricketers. It's too brutal. And from the start, I always wanted the cricketers not to be like a, because people like Steve Beggs up in Dublin Castle in Camden, he was very strict about, a bit like Joe, he was very strict about the sort of music he wanted. It would be Balamana Gators, just on those. It would be quality acts. He would not think about putting on punk. I mean, he would never, ever put on a punk band, even though, as I said in the last video, he was losing a fortune, although he hid it well. So, so I wasn't like that. I was interested in the best of everything. I used to harangue agents because the we had a great thing. The, Cricketers was quite small, it only held 200, but it was very close to the west end of London, but nobody realised how close it actually was. I lived there eventually, and I could walk to the Houses of Parliament in probably 15 minutes, and that's a gentle stroll, not a full smart. So it was very good for record companies to come down to watch bands, whereas if they were going up, say, to, I don't know, anywhere in Kentish Town, it would take you 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and it was a nice venue, and we had a lot of leeway and I made sure we had good PAs and it was a pain in my life. I used to spend a fortune on the PA and we used to have somebody to operate it. And eventually I learned how to do it myself because I was fed up of being, not held to ransom, but I could do it. I mean, another bit I missed that, see, I just think of these things as we're going through. When I was at, with Bob Kerr doing the agency, Trevor Evan Jones, who was the guy who went to see about managing him, you remember when I was 19 and he should be managing me, he by this time was a noted record producer and he'd worked at the BBC as producer on Radio 2 and stuff like that and he'd done various TV programmes and one of the acts he's producing is a band called Here and Now. alternative side of rock it was you know they did come out of punk in a way but not in the one two three four edge of punk they toured with alternative tv by the time i came across them which i think was definitely was 1980 Prevost said you could guys could work together on that so i worked with them and i think they broke up see because all these things there's so many things happened especially in the 80s that i can't remember the actual order in which things Happen. I mean, I've got a better memory than a lot of people at my age, but there's still certain things I've totally forgotten about. And some of the things I do forget, because I remember that Here and Now broke up and we sort of didn't fall out. After Here and Now had broken up, or even maybe when Here and Now were going, because I remember Here and Now did play at the, these cricketers once or twice, even though they were too big, really, because they used to pull. Well, they basically earned their following doing free festivals and by doing free gigs. So by the time I stepped in, they'd realised that, well, they, they did a show, I can't remember what it was, I think Oxford, I think, where they basically used to put a few pound in a big, book it during the last song and send it round the audience just to get people to interested to put some money in and on this particular occasion it came back with less money in than they actually put in 
So they realised that they had to start doing gigs that charge. Now the question was, would people pay to see a band that they'd only ever seen free? And the answer turned out to be yes, very much so. So that was something else I was involved in, which is very exciting. Um, we got them record deals and all things. It was all very exciting. This deserves a video by itself. So anyway, I think by the end they broke it. And Keith, who was the bassist and one of the founders of the band, came to work with me on the doing the door at the Cricketers. And occasionally do the sound. And I looked to the sound and it was all, and we were all like you know, cottage industry and I had Rebecca, who is Alan Davis's daughter, who was in Slim Chance and played the guitar with Cat Stevens. My lady She was my assistant sort of thing. So, and he used to be like a drinking friend with Ralph McTell and people like that down the half moon. And I started to say who the four people were, didn't I? The four people who were involved in the Putney, you used to call them the Putney Music Mafia, were me, obviously, we won't go into me, Joe Pearson, who was the teacher, Bill Knox, who was the Scottish man, and Johnny Jones, who was Jonah. By this stage, he stopped doing shows and he was more involved in the management. He used to be involved with Earl Oakin, who, you, if you don't know who Earl is, he's still operating now, going now. Despite all that, I want you to know that this has got absolutely nothing to do with sex whatsoever. Here's a sweet and juicy mango. Check him out. And so those were the four. So I thought I'd better round that off. Anyway, what happened was we're at the Cricketers. It was up and down. I mean, it wasn't, we we're doing every night of the week. At the same time, I was doing Tours of Ireland with Wilco Johnson, which I mentioned in my video about Wilco Johnson. Seven nights a week, 52 weeks a year. We had a bit of a break at Christmas. I think we tended not to do Christmas Day and Boxing Day, but we do practically every other day. And there were things like the World Cup, for example, when no one would go to gigs, which is a bit of a shame, because I can remember we had um, Laurel Aitken on the first Friday of a World Cup during the 1980s. Now, Laurel Aitken is one of the Scar legends, and he would always sell out big, bigger venues than that. And I thought, well, he's gonna do okay. <laughs> Literally, I think 15 people turned up to watch that, so it cost me quite a lot of money. So when you have a good night, you might earn 50 quid or maybe 100 if it's like a really good night and the band are on a lower percentage than normal, but some of the bands are on 90% of the door, so you can imagine. So anyway, in 1990, Long story, Margaret Thatcher, who was the Prime Minister at the time, decided that the breweries had too much power because generally back then the breweries owned the pubs and they brewed the beer and the pubs sold the beer that the breweries think. So in her infinite wisdom, she decided that breweries couldn't own more than I think it was 200 pubs each. So what happened was all the pub companies just formed property companies that were separate but the same people generally. Since the early days of inns and taverns, breweries earned their money by brewing beer that they sold in their inn or inns. The property company that owned, that was now running these pubs, wasn't brewing beer, so it had, only could make money from charging a rent. Basically, the property company wanted the landlord of the cricketers to pay, I think it's twice as much as they were paying pre this, and so when our lease ran out on the 30th of September 1990, off we went and a bunch of bikers moved in and it was never the same because they didn't really have the same values that we had. I mean, when we were there, Kenny and his staff cleaned the place, the bottom, and it was like, if anything got scratched, it was repainted and stuff and, and repaired. But basically they painted the whole place black. It's a whitewash, blackwash basically. So it's like cheap and horrible. And it basically meant that when it got really hot, it would drip onto people and people would have like black marks going, oh, it's just terrible. It wasn't perfect when we were there. A lot of the bands didn't like the fact that we had like murals on the walls and mirrors and it, it looked like a proper pub. I mean, that, that, that's what it was, it was a pub. And I always actually liked the fact that behind the stage there's this mural of musicians playing, looked like 1950s, but I think it was done in the 1970s. That was obviously ripped out by the bikers. Anyway, they 
totally mess it up. And they're, they're paying this high rent. They basically had to get out. There, there was a firebomb incident, let's just say. It turned out to be an insurance fraud. So that's what happened there. This is into 1991, I'd imagine, by this time. I got a job at Time Out magazine. I was doing one day a week in the music section, just doing folk, blues, and world music. And eventually that, like, increased, and I got involved with doing the food and drink and the beer and stuff, and got involved with other things. And I had a very good time at Time Out. Tony Elliott, the founder, and all the staff were very good to me. And let's just leave it there. This is the end of the video. I'm sorry if I ramble on a bit, but um, last time some people said they enjoyed the information. It's a lot longer, this one, I think, unless I cut, 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 cut when I'm editing it. But let's hope I don't. Let's see how it goes. And thank you for watching this far. I really do appreciate your company. And if you get time to comment, let me know what you think. That'd be great. And subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. Goodbye.